I'm Donovan Kane. Welcome to my weekly podcast, where I read erotic stories for women, to you. Why? Because sometimes, you just want a man to read you a naughty story. This week's story is, A Dance on the Moon. I wrote this story, and it's part of my Erotic Adventures of You series. Make sure you visit audible.com for other stories I've read, available as audiobooks. Feel free to email me and tell me what you think of this story and the others on this podcast at donovan at donovancain.com. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoy the show. A Dance on the Moon by Donovan Cain What a load of crap, you say out loud after reading the letter for the third time since receiving it in the mail this afternoon. You get a lot of ridiculous requests and invitations to check things out on almost a daily basis. As bizarre as many of them are, this one is a humdinger, as your aunt used to say. Getting strange invitations is to be expected with your job. You are a self-proclaimed bullshit debunker of hauntings. You have always been interested in ghosts, spirits, and other things that defy explanation. A few years back, you put up a website offering $10,000 for physical proof of a ghost. After receiving thousands of invitations to come to different locations and actually going to over 80 of them, three years later, that $10,000 is still in your bank account. You actually wrote the check, leaving the pay-to line blank, and you carry it with you everywhere you go, hoping someday to need it. The letter was, well the same as all the rest of the invitations, yet different. First off, it was an actual letter, not an email. Odd, because your address has never been published. Second, it stated, Well, hear for yourself. Dear Madam, In response to your very confident opinion that you shall never see actual physical proof of a ghost, I would like to help you through this difficult time you are having. You are cordially invited to spend the most delightful evening with me at my humble residence. Wine, dinner, dancing, and a trip to the moon is what I am offering. If you are interested, light a candle and display it in your parlor window at exactly 10 p.m. tonight. I will collect you, and we will be on our way. Sincerely, L. P.S. I have no interest in your check, and will allow you to keep it as a reminder that there is more to this world than you know. How does he know about the check? You had asked yourself out loud. How does he know that I love staring at the moon? Oh, hell, you had told yourself. He was simply referring to the $10,000. As for the moon, who doesn't like to look at the moon? Wow, you had thought to yourself. Not only odd, but more than a little creepy. So creepy that you have even called the police and informed them that you may have a stalker. They had told you to go ahead and light the candle. Place it in the window at 10 p.m., and they would put an undercover unit outside your house to keep watch. They told you not to worry. They said it was probably just a prank, and they doubted anyone would show up. But, in the off chance this person was real, you may as well catch him at it now and save yourself further trouble. You had agreed. You had rummaged through your storage closet and found a fake candle you use at Christmas. It is electric and even has a remote control. Perfect. With your luck, you figured if you used a real candle, you would end up burning the damn house down. Since you don't have a parlor, so to speak, you decided that your living room window would have to do. You had plugged the candle in and set it on a small table in front of the window and place the remote control on the end table next to your big comfy chair. You have just stepped out of a hot bath and have pulled on your favorite pajamas when the phone rings. Hello? You answer. Good evening, ma'am. This is Lieutenant Havlin from the police department. Just wanted you to know the undercover unit is in place outside your home. They are in a white sedan with a large dent in the driver's door. Very classy ride, <laughs> Please look out your window and confirm that you see it. You walk to the window, look out, and see it just up from the street light. Wow, you say, 
That's a real humdinger of a car. Isn't it, though? He laughs. It works great for surveillance, though, because nobody suspects it. I bet, you answer. Don't worry a bit, ma'am. These kind of things are almost always a prank of some kind. Light up the candle, and let's see what happens. Okay, and thank you, you say. No problem at all, he says, and hangs up. You sit down in your big, fluffy, comfortable reclining chair, take a big drink from your glass of wine sitting on the end table next to it, pick up the remote control, point it at the candle, and click it on. It lights up. You look around the room as if you actually expect something to happen. Nothing. You realize you are holding your breath. You let it out in a big sigh and shake your head. Silly girl. You wonder what you would have done if a ghost had actually appeared. You put your feet up and stare into the candle. For a fake candle, it is very realistic. It even has a flame that appears to flicker. It has a relaxing effect on you as you wonder, once again, if there really is such a thing as a ghost. Your eyes begin to get heavy, and you start to drift off, thinking about the moon. Madam? Madam? You faintly hear a voice say. Your eyes begin to blink and then pop wide open as you see standing before you a small roundish man dressed in a bright suit of clothes that appears to be several hundred years out of date. Oh, shit! You scream. Who the hell are you? How did you get in here? How did you get by the cops? Oh, dear, says the figure, rolling his eyes. I just appeared here. That is how. My name is Simpkins, madam. As for the cops, I am sure that I am not familiar with what a cops is. Now, if you are quite done, we really must be going. He is waiting. Ha! Huh, I'm not going anywhere. I don't care who is waiting, you say. And who the hell is he? Oh, the living. Simpkins sighs. I simply refuse to believe I was ever one of them. You jump up and throw the remote at Simpkins. It flies right through him and shatters on the wall behind. Oh, hell no, you say. Laughter erupts behind you. It's okay, Simpkins. Go on home. I'll handle this. My pleasure, sir, says Simpkins. Then he just disappears. Your eyes get big. You slowly turn to see nothing. Then, thinking you see movement, you squint and can just make out the outline of a figure. Just a transparent ripple, really, of some kind of something in the air. Hello, says the ripple. You jump and feel like you're going to piss yourself. What the hell? He laughs. For someone that talks so big about make-believe scary ghosts, well, you are plenty scared right now. And I didn't even say boo. You go from scared to pissed as you jump again because you believe this thing is making fun of you. I am not scared, just pissed off that you have broken into my house, you say. Why, not at all, he replies. I sent you an invitation. You accepted, by displaying the candle in your window as requested. I am simply here to whisk you away on our date. Ha! I will not be whisked by anyone, especially someone or something I can't even see, you object. Madam... I assure you that you have nothing to fear, he says. If you will take a moment to look into your heart, I believe you feel that you can trust me. After a brief moment, you have to admit that the thing is right. You are not scared, just startled and very curious. There, you see, he says. You have been wanting this for a very long time. I will go if you wish. Just tell me to, and you will never, um, almost see me again. Now is your chance. Are you going to take it, or not? You think it over for a brief moment, and realize you don't want to pass this opportunity up. Yes, you say. 
Very good, he says. But wait, why can't I see you like I could that Simpkins guy? You ask. Ah, yes. Well, you can only see us if we let you, he says. And even then, you can only see us as how we want you to see us. Simpkins chooses the same form most of the time. Says it fits him. Oh, well, he might be right there, you say. If I am going with you, I will need to see you. Simple as that. Okay. How would you like to see me? He asks. Um, I don't know, you say. He laughs. That's not true. I can see several forms in your head that you would love to see me in. You can see my thoughts? You ask, as you mentally try to cover some stuff up in your head, then concentrate on a white sheet with eye holes cut into it. Of course, he says. Let me just try a few on for you. Here is the first one I see in there. Poof. The white sheet with eyes you imagine appears before you. He raises his arms under the sheet and tilts his head down to look at himself. He laughs. Not very attractive for a night out. Let me have another look inside that head of yours. He says. Oh, Lord. You mumble. The figure quickly switches from a white sheet with eyes to a shirtless cowboy in chaps, to a shirtless fireman, to a shirtless gladiator, then stops as he turns into a heavily muscled Norse god, cape and all, shirtless, of course. He looks down at himself, and then up to you, with raised eyebrows. Um, I read a lot of romance novels. Like, a lot, you say. I see that. I like this one. It seems to occupy a lot of space in that pretty head of yours. What do you think? He asks. You stare at him and can feel your skin tingle. It's okay, you say with a shrug. He gives a mighty laugh. Now perhaps an outfit for you? He asks. You look down and remember you are still in your old comfy pajamas. Oh, you say as you reach both hands to your hair, thinking it must be a mess. You are perfect just like that. But let's see if we can maybe match your look to this for tonight. He motions to his outfit. Before you have time to object, he says, There, what do you think? You glance down and say, Excuse me for a second. Of course, he says, as he crosses his muscled arms and nods his head. You run to the full-length mirror in your bedroom. The reflection is of yourself, dressed and made up as a Norse goddess. Hair elaborately made up, a jeweled necklace, gold armbands around your upper arms. Your dress looks like a very thin sleeveless wrap that overlaps in the front. It is held closed in the middle only by a light golden chain. It is open in a deep V that drops clear to just above your belly button before it closes, and then parts again, high up on your thighs. The soft, silky wrap flows down your body clear to your ankles, where it overlaps sandals that are elaborately laced up to your mid-calf and are clearly visible as the opening in the front of your garment spreads wider as it reaches them. A quick feel here and there reveals that you are wearing nothing underneath. Your skin tingles, and you are suddenly very aware of your body. You take a deep breath and confidently walk out of your bedroom. It's okay, but you forgot a few items, you say. He stares at you with amazement in his eyes. No, I didn't forget. I left them out on purpose, he says. Did you accidentally forget to put anything under mine? Nope, you say, as you stare at the outline of his large penis just visible under his garment. Very well. Shall we go, my goddess? He asks, as he holds out his right hand. Where exactly are we going? You ask. Now, what fun would that be if I told you? Are you scared? He asks. You look into his eyes. You know I'm not. You give him your left hand. He gently pulls you to him, 
putting his right thigh between your legs and wrapping his right arm around your waist. Put your arms around my neck. Hold on tight. And don't let go, he says. You reach up and put your arms around his neck, pulling yourself into his muscled body. Through your thin garment, you can feel every sculpted curve of him. His now nearly hard cock is alongside your hip. Hey, I thought you were supposed to be a ghost. Why can I feel everything on your body? You ask. I have no solid form, he replies. You are only feeling what you want to feel, naughty girl. Well, you have a point there, you say. Pretty close, he says, as he presses his hardening cock against your hip. You give a little laugh. Fast or slow, he asks. What? you ask. Do you like it fast or slow? Traveling, he asks. Oh, um, you stammer. He laughs. I will show you the difference. Fast first. Are you ready? He asks. Oh, yes, you sigh as you rest the left side of your face on his massive bare chest. He pulls you tight. You feel a sort of electric hum all through your body, and there is a brief flash of bright light. Your surroundings have changed. He loosens his grip on you, and you pull away a bit so you can see. He lets you go completely, and you turn around slowly in a circle and take in the beautiful scene. You are standing on the top of a small grassy hill, surrounded by an endless prairie of grass. A sea of green waving in the slight breeze dotted with small groups of yellow flowers as far as you can see. You can smell the rich earth and flowers. The sun is bright and warm on your skin. It makes you smile. You turn to him. Where are we? What some people call the sunlit plains. He answers. Beautiful, you say, spinning around. Yes, indeed he says, as he watches you spin in the sun. You stop and look at him. How did you do that? Get us here, I mean, you ask. That is not something I could even begin to explain to you, he replies. I understand, you say. Do it again, please. Come here, he says, as he opens his arms wide. You run to him and wrap your arms around his neck again as he pulls you tight against his body once more. I'm ready, you say. You think to yourself, if he only knew how ready I am. You laugh to yourself when you remember he does. Hold on, he says. You feel that electricity pass through you again. This time it is more pleasant, since you know it is coming. A light humming vibration through your whole body, a bright flash of light again, ending in a soft orange glow. You focus your eyes and try to pull away from him again so you can see where you are. Not too far this time. I will keep a hold of you, he says. As he holds you around the waist with his right arm, you look toward the source of the orange glow. It's the sunset on water, a beautiful soft sunset amongst light purple clouds. The sun is dropping into the sea. You glance around and realize you are surrounded by water. You feel movement and look down, expecting to see a boat. That is a whale, he says. You look up at him with wide eyes and an open mouth. The whale blows a spout of water into the air. It comes down on you like rain. You laugh with delight. Both of you are soaked. You look down and see that your thin white garments are now virtually transparent. You look down at his feet and raise your gaze slowly, taking in every inch of him. When your gaze meets his eyes, he smiles. Of course you can, he says. You keep forgetting he can see into your mind. You reach with your right hand and grasp his cock. It is hard as granite and feels wonderful underneath a thin layer of damp material. He runs the fingers of his left hand through your hair you are all wet, 
he says. You laugh. You aren't kidding. Well, we will have to fix that, he says. Hold on tight. You grab a tight grip onto his cock, not wanting to let it go, as he takes a firm squeeze around your waist. You feel him taking a deep breath. To your surprise, he blows on you with the force of a strong wind. You can feel your body and garment dry instantly, your hair blowing out behind you in the wind. He smiles at you. There, he says, all dry. You smile back. Not all of me, you say. He laughs. Good. You stare at each other for a moment. Yes, I would, you say. You realize that you have just answered a question that he hasn't asked yet. How did I know that you were going to ask me if I wanted to go to your place? Did I read your mind? You ask. Maybe so, he says. Okay. Take your hand off my cock. Oh, I'm sorry, you say. No, no, just for now, he says. I want you to really feel what it's like to fly. Come by my side. I will hold you around the waist, and you put your left arm across my back and stretch your right one out to the side. I will do the same with my left. You do as he says. Hey, wait a second, you say. You mean we didn't have to hold each other that tight like before to fly? He laughs. Nope. But did you mind, really? You already know the answer to that. You say, Where is your place? I hope we will be able to see that wonderful full moon over there. That I can guarantee, he says. Okay, I'm ready, you say. You look toward the whale's head. Goodbye, Sir Whale. Goodbye, my lady, says the whale. Oh, my God! That whale can talk? You shout in excitement. The man laughs. Of course he can. Stick your arm out like a bird on your side, he says, as he sticks his out on his. You just shake your head and do as he says. In an instant, the electric hum is coursing through your body again. You are flying straight up. You look down and see the whale blow a spout of goodbye and dive under the water, waving his tail on the way down. You are rising so fast that you are already able to see the earth curve away in all directions below you. The setting sun a glowing ball of fire on one side, the rising moon a cool blue ball rising on the other. Amazing, you say. Yes, quite, he says. You look over at him. He is looking back at you. He looks forward again. I don't understand any of this, you say. Of course not, he answers. You are not supposed to. But, you begin. Listen, he says. Some things are just not explainable. You just know them when it is your time to know them. It is not your time yet. But you were raising such a stink down there and seemed so unhappy about not knowing. Well, I just wanted to give you a little peek. It helps in life to know that there is more than you can see. You will understand all of this some day. You mean when I... You start to ask. Shh. Enjoy the view he says. We are almost there. He nods to the front with his head. You look forward again. Holy shit! You exclaim. All you see is a vast area of blue-white light. We are going to crash into the damn moon! He pulls you up into level flight again. You look down, and you are skimming along just above the surface of the moon. The face of a rock wall is coming up fast. He pulls up, and you fly up the side, slowing down. As you reach the top, he stops you, and you are both suspended, hanging in midair. Welcome to my home, he says. In front of you is a flat top of a mountain. In the middle of the plateau sits a structure made of solid stone. Not made of stones like a castle, 
but instead what looks like a castle that has been carved out of the top of the mountain itself. In the middle of the large structure is a tower that ends in a flat point at the top, at what appears to be hundreds of feet above the bottom of the castle. Close your eyes, he says. You find your eyes hard to pull away from the castle itself, but you turn to face him, you nod, and close your eyes. Okay, he says. You can open them again. You open your eyes, just as he sets you down in the middle of a large, opulent room. It has a high cathedral ceiling with rafters above that appear to be made out of some kind of iridescent glowing crystal, a deep green in color. You look around the room and see it is decorated with many different kinds of unusual things, carvings, and shells. You glance at his face. Unbelievable, you say. What is all this stuff? Just things I've collected in my travels. I don't recognize any of it, you say. I wouldn't think you would, he answered. Most of it does not come from Earth. Except for that, that I recognize, you say, as you point to what looks like a large stuffed pelican standing at the end of the room. Huh, he says. That's surprising. I did not expect you to recognize him. Well, at least I made an impression, says the pelican. Oh, my God, it's you, Simpkins. So it is, madam. Will there be anything you require, sir? Some wine and dinner, Simpkins. Right away, sir. As Simpkins leaves, your host seats you at a long table, taking the seat across from you. Simpkins returns in his old human form with a large covered silver tray. He places it in the middle of the table. He reaches into his pocket, pulls out two glowing beetles, and throws them, one in front of each of you. As they hit the table's surface, they explode into elaborate wine goblets with a big silver L on the side, the liquid inside glowing the same blue as the beetles. You raise your eyebrows. Go ahead, taste it, he says. You cautiously take a sip. You instantly think it very well may be the most delicious thing that has ever crossed your lips. A flood of happiness spreads throughout your body. Wow! Good stuff, huh? He says. I think that's what you would refer to as a humdinger of a wine. You laugh. I agree. Simpkins removes the lid from the silver tray. There's nothing there. He reaches into the small breast pocket of his waistcoat, pulls out two full-size dinner plates made out of polished stone. He reaches up over the back of his head with both hands and pulls out an enormous knife and fork about two feet long each, stands a ways away from the table and goes through the motion as if he is carving something on the tray. He puts some on each plate, puts your plate in front of you, and hands you the enormous fork and knife. As soon as they touch your hands, they shrink to normal size. He turns and hands a plate to your host, along with two enormous size utensils, steps back, bows, and leaves the room. You shake your head and look at your host. Wasn't he just a pelican? Yes, he answers. Simpkins can be a strange bird at times. He laughs. I heard that, Simpkins says from the other room. You hear everything, you old eavesdropper, he says, and then looks towards you. Try it, he says. You look across the table at him. But there's nothing there to try. You look down at your plate. It is filled with your favorite meal. Oh, my God, this is ridiculous, you say. He laughs. Are you ready for the night to end yet? I think not, you reply. After enjoying your meal together while looking out the large window at the landscape of the moon, you look at your host and say, I know you say I'm not supposed to understand any of this. I will accept that. But I have to ask one thing. Okay, he says. I'll answer if I can. Go ahead. You are both ghosts, and from what I see, 
you are able to do anything you want. But how am I here? How can I fly? How can I breathe on the moon? Let me show you, he says. He stands and walks towards you, holding his hand out to you once again. You stand and take it. Close your eyes, he says. You do as he says. All of a sudden, you can see light through your eyelids. Okay, open them, he says. You open your eyes and see the landscape of the moon in all directions. The dim glowing light from the stars is lighting the entire surroundings, making everything glow that blue-white light. Where are we now? you ask. We're standing on top of the tower, on top of the castle that you saw when we flew up. It's my favorite place, he says. I can see why, you say. You look out into the sky and see a blue ball with a yellow glow coming from behind one side of it. Earth, you say. Earth with a rising sun behind it, he says. Beautiful. Yes, he says, looking at you. I believe I promised you dancing. That you did, you say. But you said you were going to answer my question. You'll see, he says. Simpkins, he yells. Some music, please. Rising up above the edge of the tower platform, you see Simpkins flying up in his pelican form. He lands next to a small stone pillar at the edge. He opens his huge pelican mouth, and out jumps a violin and bow. They land just above the stone pillar and float there. He slaps his mouth closed and lifts off the platform once again. Clapping his webbed feet together, the violin begins to play. He flies over the edge of the platform and disappears once again. Strange bird sometimes, your host mumbles. I heard that, says Simpkins. Good, says your host. He bows to you and holds out his hand. You give a small curtsy and take it. He wraps his other hand around your waist and he steps off as you follow into a slow and graceful waltz. You stare at the face in front of you and marvel at the background as you slowly spin in circles around the platform in what seems to be mid-air. You look into his eyes and you know what he is asking without being able to read his mind. Yes, please. He moves his face toward yours and kisses you, a deep, lingering kiss. The feeling flows through your body like the electric hum you felt when you were flying, only warmer and more intense. You're still slowly moving in circles with the dance. He moves his hands down to the delicate, golden chain holding your garment closed. He removes the chain and your garment falls open. He throws the chain over the side of the platform, and you look at each other and laugh. He brings your hand down to his waist and places it on his belt. You pull the end, and it comes undone and slides out from around his waist. You toss it over the side, too. As you continue to move in a circle, his garment comes open, and he grabs it and throws it over the side as well. He stops moving in a circle, releases you, and steps back. You reach with both of your hands to each side of your garment right under your neck. You open it fully and let it fall to the platform. You step back over it and give it a kick. Over the side it goes. The only thing that both of you have on now are the golden bands around your arms, and you the beautiful jeweled necklace around your neck. You look at the man. His muscular body is glowing in the starlight. Behind him, you see the earth with its rim glowing on one side from the rising sun. I have never seen a figure of a man so perfect, you say. Remember, he says, I have no physical form. You have created this. Damn, I'm good, you laugh. Not good, he says as he stares at you. Perfect. Starlight. 
Never looked like that before. Have a look. You look down at your body, and you see stars right through it. No, not through it. In it. Your body is actually made of stars. I don't understand. Am I? No, no, you're fine. It's just that not all of you is here. That's why you can do all of this. You mean this is not real? Oh, no, no, it's very real. I don't understand at all. I know. We talked about that. Don't try to understand. Just enjoy. I just realized I don't even know your name. Only that it starts with an L. Lucian, he says. Fast or slow? Um, you say. I will show you fast. You give him a look that says you are a bit disappointed in that choice. Oh, don't worry, he says. Fast doesn't mean bad in this case. It just means it gets right to the point. Really? You say. Let me show you. He walks toward you, his muscular body flexing in the starlight, his enormous cock standing straight up, moving back and forth with each step. He places a hand on each side of your waist. You put your arms around his neck once again. He lifts you so your breasts are even with his face. He kisses you in the middle of your chest and then lowers you slowly onto the shaft of his cock. The warm electrical hum in your body turns into a wonderful feeling of fire as he enters you. You wrap your arms tight around his neck as you slide down his long shaft. As you reach the base and you have taken all of him inside you, he balances you on the base of his cock. You wrap your legs around his waist. He wraps both of his muscular arms around your waist and slides them up to the middle of your back and pulls your breasts toward his chest. He squeezes you tight and whispers in your ear, Are you ready? Oh, my God you say. Ready for what? Hold on tight, he says. He puts pressure upwards with his cock and applies downward pressure with his arms and a quick thrust of motion. You throw your head back. It feels like your body explodes. Pieces flying in every direction. The pieces begin to spread out in the black sky and you can feel yourself in every piece. The pieces fly so far and are so spread out that you feel like you are actually a part of the universe itself. You have exploded into millions of tiny, feeling, shining stars. You hear a ringing over and over. Your eyes flutter. You focus on the candle and you look around and you realize it's the phone ringing on your nightstand. You shake your head and answer your cell phone. Hello? You say groggily. Yes, ma'am. Lieutenant Havlin here. Everything is fine. Nobody showed. You look at the clock. It's midnight. You shake your head again. We're going to have to give up for the night. Let us know if you need us. Thank you, Lieutenant. You mumble. You end the call and set your cell phone down on the end table. I can't believe it, you say to yourself. It seems so real. I dreamt the whole damn thing. Silly girl, you know there's no such thing as ghosts. You reach over and grab your wine glass. Just as you're about to take a sip, you hold it up and see an elaborately carved goblet with a big silver L on the side. You smile. Take a drink and feel the warm glow inside. The End I hope you enjoyed this week's story, A Dance on the Moon. It's also available as an audiobook at audible.com, along with other titles that I have read. Don't forget to follow the podcast 
there's a new free story every week. And please, feel free to email me at donovan at donovancain.com with any comments. Thank you for listening. I'm Donovan Kane. For now, goodbye.